This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. So we are understanding in the kingdom of God and what it means to us um, in the 21st century Western culture. So Ben said last week that the kingdom of God was the gospel of the early church that we are living in God's story. But how does that look for us? And I'm hoping today that as we look at this passage that that will be unraveled a little bit more. So we find ourselves back on the journey of Jesus. He's getting closer to Jerusalem. He's been baptized for about three years and he's openly declared that the kingdom has come. And he spent those three years teaching the kingdom of the gospel, both in demonstration and with words. So he's in Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's 17 miles away. He's in a place called Jericho. So he's very close to the end. When he arrives in Jerusalem, he's about to be tried and judged and declared that he is going to be crucified. That is how close he is to the end of his time on earth. He's already shared with his disciples that the kingdom, that he's going to have to go away. In Luke 18, verse 31, he says, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. However, despite Jesus telling the disciples this, they've still got a different understanding of what is about to happen when they get to Jerusalem. In hindsight, we know exactly what's going to happen. That passage sounds so clear as to what's going to happen to Jesus. But thank goodness for hindsight. (laughs) But Jesus wants to tell the disciples what is about to happen. Because they were expecting that he was going to bring his kingdom by force. They were thinking that he was going to reveal himself as Messiah and the political saviour of Israel. They thought the kingdom was going to appear immediately by taking those in authority in Jerusalem out of power. And so Jesus, being aware of this, tells them a parable. And this parable is that of the ten miners. So a miner, just before I read it, is a unit of money. And one miner is worth about three months' wages. So we're going to look at that in Luke 19, starting at 11. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 miners. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you do not put in and reap what you did not sow. 
His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put it in and reaping what I did not snow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mine away from him and give it to the one who has 10 miners. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. So the parable of the ten miners, it can often be thought to be the same as the parable of the talents, if that one came to mind when I mentioned it. That's found in Matthew 25. It takes on that similar pattern that we've just read. But there are some differences that separate them. First, Luke, who the um, parable of the ten miners is in, his audience is not just the disciples, like in Matthew, but it's also to those that are passing by. Second, this parable is told in a different location and at a different time. Third, in the parable of the miners, each person is given the same amount of money as opposed to people of different abilities assigned different tasks according to their capacities. So this ultimately leads to a different understanding and outcome as to that given about the parable of the talents. For God distributes gifts accordingly to his own pleasure, but others are universally given to each and every believer, and that is what we see here. So this parable about the miners is addressing the crowd's wrong understanding. As we've just read verse 11, they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So through this parable, Jesus tries to make it clear that the kingdom is not going to be seen in all its fullness when he arrives in Jerusalem. It's not going to be a political takeover. In fact, there is actually going to be a delay for Jesus was going away. As we saw in the parable, the nobleman, the master is representing Jesus and he was going off to a far land highlighting the pe- to the people that it wasn't just a short journey it was a far off land it was going to take time before he returns as king and ushered in this fullness of his kingdom Morrison comments on this parable it taught in figure that there must be departure and the long absence of the king before the kingdom could come in its full glory. So in light of preparing them for this, he also wanted to leave them with instruction of how to conduct themselves in his absence. The nobleman called his servants to him and said, put this money to work until I come back. So what were the nobleman's servants meant to do in his absence? They were to carry on the nobleman's business, the master's business, using the resources which he had given them and using them to their utmost in obedience to what he had asked. So when the master, the nobleman, when he returns from his journey, he first summons his three servants, those who he had entrusted each with one minor, to see how faithful they had been with doing as he asked, continuing his business. So we're told of what happened to three out of ten, and I think that's all we needed to hear about, because what comes from this is two responses. Those who used the money for good, and those who did nothing with the money. So the first response is with the two servants. They were both given one minor, and they both made more. So the first servant, he made an impressive 1,000% increase. And the second, a 500% increase. And the response that was given to them from the master for demonstrating their faithfulness to him was being given authority over cities in the kingdom. They each received the amount in relation to how much they had profited. But what is also interesting is it is the man who received the 10 minors 
who made the biggest increase is told by the master, well done, good servant. The second one, despite making a profit, is not told this. It's also interesting to note that the reward for the servant who had been faithful, it wasn't rest. It wasn't, well, you've done a great job, put your feet up. No, it was to be given more service, more to do, more responsibility. Barclay comments on this parable about this specific thing. The great reward of God to the man who has satisfied the test is more trust. To be trusted by God with more. But the response from both servants, it wasn't about themselves. They didn't say, well, I did work amazingly. I did work really hard, put all the hours in. You know, I am just amazing. Thank you very much. No, they give praise to the resource that the master had given them. They say, master, your miner, your miner has earned 10 miners. It was your resource that led to the increase. We then hear from the third servant, our second response. And what a different response it is. Instead of investing, instead of using the resource given to him to continue this work of the master, he went on to excuse basically his disobedience by highlighting how powerful the master was. That surely if the master is that powerful, why did he need his help? I mean, the way he responded, it didn't even comply with the minimum of like burying the miner in the ground. He, he kept it in a handkerchief. You know, even if he had taken it to the bank or um, to the money lender um, and, and given that money in, he could have made more money from it. He could have invested it in something, but he didn't do anything. And so the response he s received from the master was, was different. There was no good and faithful servant for recognizing how powerful God was or how successful he was. No, the response to the servant was a rebuke. You wicked servants. He was also not rewarded with anything in the kingdom. But he had everything taken from him. He was given no reward. He still remained the master's servant and lived in his house, but he was left with nothing. He was stripped of everything. You see, his response about how powerful the master was, that should have inspired him to be great and diligent, you know, to do something with what the master had left him. But for him to do nothing, to do nothing with what the master had given him. It was disobedient. It was lazy. And there was no reward for someone of that nature, for that response. He proved himself unable to manage the master's things. He proved himself unfaithful and untrustworthy. So Jesus says in Luke 18, sorry, Luke 8 verse 18, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. This is seen when the one miner that the disobedient servant had was taken from him and given to the one with 10. It wasn't saying the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. No, these words are in context about a man whose abundance showed that he made good use of what was given to him. And then the man who made no use of what had been given to him. So why would the one with 10 miners ruling over 10 cities need another one? But that's the wrong question. Because it comes back to the principle of what Jesus has just said. Whoever has will be given more for the smallest gift. That one miner must be used and put to good news. So once the master has dealt with the servants, he sorted out the way they responded and, and given the reward accordingly, he calls in his enemies, his subjects who rejected him, who didn't want him to be their king, and he orders them to be killed. Whether his enemies wanted him to be king or not, 
that did not affect the outcome. He was going to be king. But they did have a choice, and that was whether they would become his servants or choose to reject him. And the enemies who rejected the king represent anyone who denies God. Past, present, future, for everyone has the choice to follow God. So just in case it's not clear, in case I've not made it clear, so the master, the nobleman, he represents Jesus. He left the world when he was killed for our sins, but he will return one day and bring his kingdom in all its fullness. For as Jesus has already declared, the kingdom has come, but it will not be here in its entirety until he returns. That is why we can see glimpses of the kingdom. We can see things happen that is like, that is kingdom. That is what is meant to be part of the kingdom of God. But we can also see times when we think, but that doesn't look like kingdom. But just like the servants who receive the miners and are charged with continuing his business, we as his followers of Jesus are to continue his work. And that is bringing, ushering the kingdom in. This means we live by a different manifesto to the world around us. Our manifesto is what Jesus declared in his word. The example that he left us by the way he demonstrated what the kingdom was. So just to give an example, sickness. Sickness is not of the kingdom. Therefore, we are to pray for healing for the sick. And you might be thinking, but I've done that before. I've prayed for someone and they didn't get healed. And then so I thought, well, I'll try it again. And I prayed for someone and they didn't get healed. But this is an example of where the kingdom has come, but not in all its fullness. For when the kingdom comes in all its fullness, there will be no sickness. But whose manifesto are we going to live by? Experience? the world, what the world tells us, or what we know to be true of the kingdom of God. Therefore, we continue to pray for the sick because his kingdom is here and it is expanding every day. There are so many examples, slavery, poverty, injustice, you know, taking it really to home, you know, in your workplace, in your family, your friends, We've each been given this minor, the kingdom of the gospel, and the outworking of this will look different for each person as we have different surroundings and different giftings. But even when we can't see the kingdom being outworked in our workplace, let's continue to pray, continue to usher his kingdom in, the kingdom of what Jesus declared and demonstrated, for this is the master's business that has been entrusted to each one of us who are followers of God. You know, in our families, our friends, let us demonstrate the kingdom, not just in words, but with our lives. And that is by living according to the manifesto of Jesus, that even when we might not see something in the way we think it should look, we continue to bring his manifesto. We continue to bring the way he has given us that example to live by. The example that we're not to live by is the third servant who hid the miner. He was disobedient. He was lazy in his response to what had been asked of him. Yes, our God is sovereign. He is all-powerful. But you know what? He wants us to work with him. Therefore, we are to carry on the work of Jesus. David Guzik, in his commentary, he wonderfully comments on this parable. The unfaithful servants were those who thought that because their master was so mighty, he did not need their help. But the issue is not his need of my help. The issue is my need to help him and my need to be part of his work. From this, we can see that it was not the master needing them to do this to make money for him, but to partner with him to develop character within them. They needed to work with him to build their character. 
See, we've been entrusted with the task of continuing to usher in his kingdom. As we said at the beginning, the parable of the miners is it's different to the parable of the talents. For in this parable, each has been given the equal amount. We've all been given, they've been, they were given one miner. We've all been given an equal amount, the gospel of the kingdom. We have all been given grace, the chance to be adopted as children of God, the opportunity to be a part of God's family. We have all been given the great commission in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what does this teach us about kingdom? One, Jesus will return. And when he does, he will bring his kingdom in in its entirety. There will be no more sickness, no more poverty, no more injustices, slavery, etc. Whatever situation you can think of. As his fo- secondly, as his followers, we have been left with the resource to continue the work of ushering in his kingdom. We are to be about his business, taking the example of Jesus and not our experience that is not in line with the kingdom or the world's understanding. When Jesus walked this earth for three years, he taught the kingdom in words and in demonstration. But what will our response be with what we have been freely given? Will we be like the first two servants who continued the work and saw growth in our work, communities, our friends, our family. Those two sermons, they did not make it about them, but they recognized it was because of what they were given that they were able to do this. They remained faithful despite the difficulties and setbacks that they would have faced, the rejection that they would have faced. They would have been attacked There were people around them who did not want this person to be their king, but they continued to remain faithful. Or will our response be like the third servant who was not faithful to the master's business? You know, a few reasons were given for the third servant's response. One, fear. Two, laziness. Three, wicked. And as Chuck Smith says in his commentary on Luke, now is the word of Jesus to the waiting church, occupy till I come. We are not to sit back and say, well, the Lord is coming. There's no sense of finishing my education. Well, the Lord's coming. There's, there's no sense of not entering into the business venture or let's just wait because the Lord's coming. We are not to plan our lives. Well, let's go and just charge everything because the Lord's coming and we won't have to pay for it. Or what about not taking risk? You know, risk of someone not being healed so we're not going to pray or you know how will I deal with that or the risk of being laughed at or or attacked or rejected by those around me or the risk of failure getting it wrong or the risk of success and it all just going to my head and becoming proud but we cannot live by faith and not take risks Third, when Jesus returns with his kingdom in all its fullness, he will reward those who are faithful. And what it suggests is levels of authority in his kingdom, but those who are not faithful will have everything taken from them. And fourth, Jesus' kingdom will rule in its entirety one day. No question about that. But the question to each person is, will you be part of it? Will you choose to follow him or will you reject him? T.W. Manson in his book, The Sayings of Jesus, says, We may be horrified by the fierceness of conclusion, but beneath the grim imagery is an equally grim fact. The fact that the coming of Jesus to the world puts every man to the test, compels every man to decision. And that decision is no light matter. It is a matter of life and death. And that's what I wanted to share really with the the parable of the miners today. 
you know, our responsibility. The King Jesus, he is going to return one day. But right now we have been left to continue his work, to continue the work of ushering in the kingdom. And he resources us. We have been blessed with the Holy Spirit and he continues to resource us in all that he asks us to do. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.